name is Bill Barker. I work for JISC CETUS, which is the JISC funded Innovation Support Centre for Educational Technology and Interoperability Standards. Um, and I've been asked to talk about issues around open educational resources, managing and disseminating open educational resources in particular. So can I just start with a quick show of hands? Who out of you is involved in a project that has something to do with open educational resources? That's good. Right. Who is involved with a repository in which open educational resources or educational resources of any sort are stored? About the same. Excellent. But not very many. Good. My presentation is going to follow this sort of structure. I'm going to start off with trying to explain what OERs are. I'm going to go through who is releasing them and why they want to do it. And I think if you then those will give you, that will give you the background, especially the what and the why, is to understand how open educational resources are being re um, released in the way that they are. Okay, what are open educational resources? The easy bit to define is open, so I'll do that first. The difficult bit to define is what's an educational resource, so I'll, I'll do that second. The great and the good declared in Cape Town um, about four years ago, that open educational resources should be freely shared through open licenses which facilitate use, revision, translation, improvement and sharing by anyone. Open licenses, I and mean, if you're dealing with open access research repositories, then you'll be familiar with at least the top six of these open licenses. Um, you've probably come across the concept of public domain or resources, and in the UK the term is out of copyright. Those Two little logos down at the left, a little hint of the sort of diversity that's to come when we're talking about educational resources rather than research outputs. They're the logo that symbolise um, open source software and open hardware. Yes, there is such a thing as freely shareable hardware. Look at it in a little bit more detail, that Cape Town Declaration, and it says that you've essentially got to be able to make derivatives of the resources. So the Creative Commons, no derivative licences, aren't so good for open educational resources. We're getting a bit more dogmatic here. If we want to get quite a lot more dogmatic, we can look at the term that says anyone and, says, and say, well, okay, that includes people who work in commercial um, organizations who want to use these for commercial uses. So maybe the not commercial restriction on um, Creative Commons licenses is um, too restrictive for a truly open resource. That's maybe getting a little bit too dogmatic. Um, but it does at least simplify the range of licenses that are, available, that are um, uh, of interest. Okay, open educational resources, or courseware, or learning objects, or teaching resources, or educational materials. What is the difference between all of them? Well, I think that dogmatic definitions don't work here, so let me instead talk about chairs. <laughs> Here's a chair. It's a very nice chair. You might want to describe that chair as being the ideal chair and talk about various properties that it has. It's got, um, well, it's raised from the ground by four legs. Uh, it's got a nice padded seating area. It's got a back you can lean on. It's got nice padded armrests. That's a wonderful chair. That's the paradigm of chairs, if you like. Then somebody else comes along and says, sorry, I can't get very many of them in my library. Um, they won't group together nicely around desks so that people can actually work from them. This is what I think is a good chair. It's nicely defined, it's compact. Then somebody else comes along and says, well actually when I'm out walking the dog, or if I'm in the park having lunch with somebody and I want to sit down, this is what I want as a chair, really. You know, this will do me, this is fine. And you're looking at that and you think, well, it hasn't got so many of the features that we started off with. <laughs> um, and somebody else comes along and says, well, I you know, when I'm out at night or in my bar, this is the type of chair that I want. You know, I want people to be the same height as people who are talking, and you look, well, actually, that looks an awful lot different from either that or that. So you might want to come up with a definition that keeps everybody happy. And in order to avoid terminological wars, you might want to say, okay, we'll, def we'll, we'll say this is a seat. You know, we'll, we'll get back all of, you know, we'll get away from all of the arguments over whether something is a stool or a bench or a chair and just call them all seats. How do we define a seat? Well, it's something for sitting on. Okay? Oops. Is everything that you can sit on a seat? 
Well, if I needed to tie my bootlaces, I'd be quite happy to sit on that. But if somebody's trying to me as a seat, I think I'm not be so sure. So, educational resources. Something that's useful for teaching and learning, or something that's designed with pedagogic intent. Those are definitions that more or less work. The point is, you know one by its use. You recognize one when, it's, when you see one, but you can't define the properties of one. Um, certainly in terms of resource types, it could be anything where, well, here's a, um, a limited subset of the anythings that are often found as being, open edu as, as being educational resources. You might have home courses, you might have lecture notes from the entire course or from an individual lecture. You might have the presentation slides that have been used, you might have handouts, you might have audio or video recordings of lectures, assignments that have been given to students as part of a course, tests or exams with or without answers, reading lists that are given to students, um, there might be images, there might be videos, there might be simulations, there might be electronic textbooks, you might even have students' work. That's a great diversity of different types of resources and they come in all different types of formats as you can imagine. Now, I know that with research repositories, and we've heard a few of these already today uh, from the arts, where you deal with many different types of output, but most repository software for, yeah. most repository software that's been aimed at institutional research repositories has kind of built itself around the assumption that what you're going to get is a single atomic PDF, you know, one isolated document. What I'm trying to say is that within the research community you might have special cases that are not like that. For educational resources they are absolutely the norm. Everything is what the research repository world might think of as being a difficult case. Right, who's, re who's involved in releasing open educational resources? I'll start with MIT OpenCourseWare because they were the first people who started doing it at scale and they set in train a, a load of events that led to a lot of the thinking that we now have about educational resources. Uh, MIT OpenCourseWare, okay. I imagine many of you have heard about it. I hope a lot of you have heard about it. When do you think it was launched? And how many courses do you think? Uh, you just have a quick think. I'm not going to ask the people to come up with ideas, because some of you all know the answers. Right. It was launched over 10 years ago, and it has more than 2,000 courses. It's more than 2,000 courses available. It's long term, it's large scale. It's not, as somebody described it to me only a month ago, a gimmick. It's a real commitment. That is something, that idea is something that has been taken up by other institutions around the US initially. They formed a consortium called the Open Courseware Consortium. They started getting funding in from various um, uh, charitable organizations. Um, have we got, yeah, we've got into Europe now. We've got beyond Europe. The idea has spread. Um, a lot of this has been funded by the Hewlett Foundation. Right, we've got to the UK now where Open Nottingham Oxford and the Open University kick-started the area and then JISC started funding, or HEFKI started funding other institutions to take part. Those were all institutions, what we call big OER. Individuals are involved as well. Um, these are all resources that have been put up by individual teachers, some of them acting off their own bat, if you like, although with funding, others working through um, organization or working through initiatives such as Humboldt, which was one of the um, HE Academy subject center um, <coughs> based projects. Not the most of the slides, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to give the impression that, as well as being something that's been going for a long time, time involves a real commitment, at least on the part of some of the players, it is extremely widespread. That, that was only a small number of the thousand or so institutions that, we, that are releasing. <coughs> In terms of initiatives, Hefke decided um, a bit over th around three years ago that it wanted to promote open educational resource release in English universities, and so it started providing funding, and funding that backed some of the, the last few of those projects that we saw. It's put five million pounds, more or less, a year in for the last three years, which, given the sort of constraints it's been uh, working under, represents quite a, quite, quite a 
commitment on its part. So why are all of these institutions and individuals and releasing OERs and why is it being supported by people like EFKI? Well, okay, you can say it's all about sharing, sharing resources, um, either internally or externally. Yes, the idea of open is that it helps you share to people who aren't inside your <coughs> institution, but having resources <coughs> only available actually makes it easier to find for people who are inside your inside the institution. And it's about sharing to, to academics, to students, and to others, to potential students, to lifelong learners, to policy makers, and, and to the just casually interested. Somebody wants to learn a little bit more about quantum mechanics in the evenings, for example. Um, this two bit, if I don't come back to it, this two bit again is something that's different um, between educational resources and research repositories. Research repositories, you kind of assume that the person who's reading a research paper is going to be another researcher of some sort. Um, educational resources, that's absolutely not the case. Could be anybody. Trouble with that is that if I went to my um, uh, principal or vice chancellor and said, I want to share resources. I think the institution should share resources. He'd say, yeah, fine, why? And I could make arguments like, well, you know, it, it's not like sharing pizza. If you give away an electronic copy of a resource, you've still got the resource. You can give it away a thousand times and you've still got what you started with. And he'd say, fine, but I never thought I was running a pizza restaurant. I'm running a university. I've got, um, you know, I've got a mission to fulfill. I've got... Uh, got to get students here, I've got to get money in. So, if I were to go to a principal or vice chancellor and say, why release OERs, I would probably start with the university charter, which actually does say something along the lines of um, sharing is good, but it puts it in different language. It says, the objects of the university shall be to advance learning and knowledge by teaching and research, by Mrs. Harriet Watts, so it says particularly in science technology and in technology, and to enable students to obtain the advantages of a liberal university education. Um, you know, I would say, well, liberal university education. Um, sorry, start with students. Getting the advantages of a liberal university education. There's nothing there that says only those students who have enrolled at Harry and Watt for as long as they pay £9,000 a year. You know, it's just a general statement. And most university charters have a general statement like this, that their role is to enhance learning. And it's a very general role. So open educational resources does fit in with the role that universities are set up to do. So much for the nice stuff. Um, OERs are also good marketing. If you look, university <coughs> marketing departments will worry about the Google rank of their course prospectuses and departmental web pages and the like. And if you look at what Google says about um, how, to get, how, how to get a good Google page rank, how to appear on the first page for particular searches, it says step one, uh, create compelling content that other people will link to. And an anonymous person said last a couple of weeks ago to me, OERs are potentially compelling content, not like research papers. <laughs> um, another way of looking at it is that your open educational resources are providing something like a shop window. That they're showing what you have to offer, at least a, a, a bit of what you have to offer, because it, you know, it, it's not the full educational experience, obviously, but it's showing students and other partners what it is that you do. You know, it's no good telling a 17 year old that you do um, systems integration in your computer science degree because they won't know what that means. Um, again, an idea of the effect that that can have comes from the Open Learn, which, Open Learn, which is the Open Universities Initiative. And, okay, they're a bit different. But it says a reasonable estimate of recruitment influenced by Open Learn is the approximately 10,500 students since, la since launch who have made use of Open Learn before they register for a course at the OU in the same online session. And that's the sort of figure that gets a, a principal or vice chancellor sat up and listening. Thank you. OERs also help facilitate partnerships with local businesses, um, with local or national charities, partnerships with overseas institutions, some universities like my own have partnerships with institutions of, um, 
around the world to deliver our learning materials uh, because and, and OER's help here because they advertise the presence of the university and what we have. They get around some of the questions like what have you got? What have you got that we can use? Is it stuff that we need to deal with third party licenses in order to use it overseas or anything like that? Does it have any, you know, for UK education use only restrictions <coughs> which are a pain if you're delivering a UK <coughs> education degree but you happen to be doing it through an organisation in I don't know, India or wherever. Um, and it provides access to all of these non-traditional users without stretching the very traditionally defined boundaries of, of most VLEs. If I tell you a VLE, you know, some of your you've got students on the same course, some of whom are on, a, are on an academic year that runs from September to September, others on the same course are on an academic year that runs from January to <coughs> December. It's a problem. Okay, this is the sort of stuff that when, when my eyes starts being shiny, I, I get a bit evangelical because this is the really interesting stuff for uh, teaching and learning people. But I'm going to skip just to the last point and say that it can provide new approaches to resource management because that's probably the side that interests you. Um, the use of social sharing sites such as YouTube, iTunes, SlideShare, and the rest. Um, gets towards being a no-brainer, I think, for open education resources. You know, when you think of the stuff that you're trying to make available to as many people as possible. You know, certainly, the you know, marketing department have a YouTube channel. You know, if you're thinking of um, putting, using educational resources for um, marketing purposes, then you put them on a YouTube channel. And that deals with a lot of the problems to do with how do you stream these video, or how do you stream all of this video that you've got. So, one interesting aspect, I've just put a mite up there, I must point you to the mite that OERs might have is that they might help with some of the tricky problems around um, delivering online content. Okay, how are these OERs being released by the various institutions who are involved? A quick summary of what I've covered so far um, by way of compare and contrast with traditional repositories. Licensing is important. Sure. Um, all sorts of content types and formats. Complex objects and related resources are absolutely normal. If you think of what learning is, it involves making relationships between lots of different um, concepts, lots of different ideas, and so it's not surprising that those relationships are built in, or need to be built in, to the resources that you, that, that, that you learn from, if they're actually something that's useful for, for education. You get all sorts of users, learners as well as academics, um, and exposure is absolutely important. Um, I've put stuff that needs to be on the web, not in the repository. Um, what's important is that people can find stuff in the places where they normally go for web content, which essentially is, is Google. Um, making sure that you can plug into <coughs> library discovery services by using OAI, PMH, or Z39.anything, or SRU, is less important than making sure that ordinary users can find this resource in the place where they normally go when they're using their content. Right, what does that actually mean for how OERs are released? Step one, first catch your rabbit. Um, people aren't producing educational resources, lecturers aren't producing educational resources in a way that can be um, published. So you have to collect together the slides, you have to record lectures, either audio or visually. Um, you have to then look at the resources that you've got and filter them for IPR issues. On the positive side, it's quite unlikely that the lecturer will have given away the university's IPR to a publisher. On the negative side, there will frequently be third-party resources included in, that, in, in the teaching materials that the university doesn't own and that the university can't license openly. Um, and kind of slip down to the bottom is a very important one about quality control. If somebody publishes a paper in a journal, 
then that paper will have a title at the top of it. It will have the author's names and institution on it. There will be a whole load of information about what it's about what that paper's about. There will be, be keywords. There will be information about the journal where it was published, hopefully. That, I'm not talking about metadata held in a record in the repository. I'm talking about what is actually on the paper, the physical, digital PDF. Normally, when people do PowerPoint slides for a lecture, they don't say who they are. If they're giving a lecture to the students who they see every week, they don't say who they are. They don't say which institution mm -hmm. they're at. Um, they don't say what course it's for. You know, they assume that their students are going to know that. Um, you may laugh, but I've seen many of them that have been published without that information being added. <laughs> Serious. Um, as I mentioned, Hefke have funded um, a raft of projects to release open educational resources. Um, JISC and CETUS in particular have been involved in giving the um, technical advice for how that should be done. The technical advice on hosting and disseminating OERs runs along these lines. Projects should deposit their content in at least one openly accessible system or application with the ability to produce RSS and or Atom feeds. For example, an open institutional repository, an international or subject area open repository, an in institutional website or blog on Web 2.0 service. I want to contrast that to the repository and preservation programs that GISC ran, where it was step one, set up a repository, step two, put things in it. The given was the repositories in the name of the programs. We haven't said you must have a repository. We, we haven't said you must do it in any particular way because we, we weren't in a position to say one way works better than another. Um, two things came out from reflections on the GISC repository and preservation programs. Um, one was that there had been too much focus on one particular way of disseminating the resources and not enough focus on the end that you wish to achieve. In other words, too much on setting up a repository, not enough on how you can actually make resources available for people to use more generally. And the second one was that educational materials have been particularly poorly served by that um, emphasis. If you want to read a little bit more about this, then there's a, a paper that um, some colleagues and I put together. Uh, then and now. Mm -hmm. that later. Okay, what the projects actually did, these are the um, HA Cabot, no, FP funded projects. No, no. Start with MIT. MIT have many types of resources that are targeted at learners. Um, they use a bespoke <coughs> web content management system to handle this. I, I don't know what they do, probably. Uh, I don't know what it is, it looks like something they've written themselves. Um, the resources are arranged by course, so you have electrical engineering and computer science, you then find various courses listed under that, such as Operating Systems 101. If you click down into Operating Systems 101, it will be arranged in the, the 20 lectures or whatever um, that course was delivered as, and you'll get well, any of the stuff that I mentioned earlier in the presentation that's relevant to each lecture. Oxford University have done something slightly different in that they have at least initially focused on podcasting audio and video recordings of lectures. They're, they're expanding out of that now. They're, they're very interested in e-books at the moment. Um, they use a, a content management system that's based on Drupal, the, the, um, the, the of themselves and they arrange their content by series which is kind of a generic term for, for course or, or module or um, like you see we've got things like alumni weekend which is a slightly different um, by department both of which makes sense I think for any institution and by people which makes sense if you're Oxford and you've got people like Richard Dawkins delivering lectures on Marcus de Sertori or you know, any of the other um, um, Academic, um, celebrities. 
Um, the other thing that they've done from the start, which is very interesting and which they've got a huge number of hits from, is disseminating via iTunes U, which is show for iTunes University. Um, it was one of their quantum mechanics lectures that featured on the advert for the first iPad. That's the sort of level of marketing that they've managed to get out of this. They've got hundreds of thousands of hits. Um, Nottingham, um, they again have a wide range of course materials. Uh, they're the first one um, that I've dealt with that use a, um, a repository platform called Equella. Uh, the first one that's um, I've given an example of that's specifically designed for teaching and learning materials. Um, it's arranged by faculty, they allow tagging, they've got searching, they've got the sort of usual repository function. Perhaps the most interesting thing about what they do though is that they use the repository to some extent as a back end and it links into other services that they have, such as their Malaysian and Chinese campuses. Humbox, this is the last one, I think. Um, Humbox is different again because it's not institutionally based, it's um, humanities subject area. Um, again, they have a wide range of course materials. I think I'm right in saying that this is the first one that has um, unmediated deposit as a possibility. You know, the lecturers can go uh, and deposit their materials here. With the others, there's some level of mediated deposit. I think I'm right in saying that, I'm not 100% sure. If this wasn't being recorded, I'd give it to you as absolute gospel. <laughs> <laughs> their audience is academics and students. Again, they're slightly different from the others in that they have um, sharing from between academics as quite high in their list of um, priorities. So, um, they use ePrints and EdShare. Um, they're based at Southampton University, so that's no surprise. Um, they allow social profiles for the depositors. Um, they allow links to be made between different people who are using the resources. Again, here I think, think academics here. Um, and they have a very interesting way that allows different users to clone a resource and change it, adapt it for their own use, and then deliver it, say, it can be delivered straight off the Homebox platform to, to the students that are of that second academic, second academic group. Um, so they've done some really interesting stuff on really addressing this um, open educational practice idea that I skipped over earlier and addressing the, some of the benefits that you might get if somebody says, oh, I think that one would look, that, that resource looks great, but I think it would be better if it had a different explanation of this particular concept. So uh, allowing people to improve on other people's resources, which again has some advantages. What I've attempted to do is to give you the background and some tasters that will allow you to understand um, or start looking at the reasons why different um, OER projects have taken different approaches. If you want the full technical summary of the lot, then that's um, a link to a load of blog posts that my former colleague um, John Robertson did describing the different technical approaches that have been taken by the UK OER projects. I haven't mentioned metadata. I think I'm quite pleased not to have time to mention <laughs> metadata. If you're particularly interested in metadata for open educational resources, then Here's another link that you can go to and have a look at. And it's a, a similar summary of the different descriptive approaches, the different approaches that have been taken to describe the OER as by various projects. And I really didn't think I would do that in time. <laughs> <laughs>